In the news, spring training 1991. A time to head back to the basics. Hi, I'm Burt Blylevin of the California Angels. Oh, I'm here to welcome back two of my friends that spent many years in Japan, Matt Keel and Floyd Bannister. We want to welcome them back That's to Bannister. the United States. Bannister. <laughs> oh, I forgot to go on. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Welcome back to the real world. Welcome back to the real world. Welcome back to the Welcome back to the real world. Major League Baseball at its finest. <laughs> While some angels aspire to the good old USA, others dream of days when they'll do some play-by-play. -play. There's a ground ball picked up by Fred Manrique, thrown across the infield. Hey, Wallace Joyner, that's right the down. end of the end. Three up, three down. No runs, no hits, no errors for the blue team, the gray team, coming up. McCaskill making a fine choice so far. Wop, baba, loo, wop, wop, bam, boom! Spring with sunshine above and a song in the heart. <laughs> One Steve, y'all been begging for this for two years now. Um <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want to thank, thank you for, for this wonderful award. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that the mess was going to let me play as much as they did, but I am definitely happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Short right, foul ball. Bensinger wants it. Cincinnati, the champions of baseball for 1990. Baseball interrupt us. That's what Cincinnati pitcher Tom Browning experienced during game two of the 1990 World Series when he became a father for the third time. A labor of love that began for wife Debbie at the ballpark. The doctor advised her not to go to the ball game, but because it's a World Series, she wanted to go. And I'm sitting in the dugout, and about the seventh inning, one of the uh, clubhouse guys, Rick Stell, came up to me and said, uh, Tom, your wife's downstairs. She needs someone to move a car. And his eyes got bigger than light bulbs. I mean, he's just like... And so uh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know then that she was, you know, in labor or anything like that. And uh, he went out to the parking lot, and then he found out. And so he just left right away, uniform and all. And I felt kind of goofy walking into the hospital, you know, with my uniform on. And people, I think, probably looked at me like I was some crazy fan, you know. But I had to do what I had to do. I didn't care what I had on. I didn't, didn't figure I had time to change. I just got in the car and left. I got there and uh, was watching the ball game. And then about the uh, eighth or ninth inning, I think it was the ninth inning, I saw Lou on TV. I mean, just furious, screaming, and just. And I thought he was mad at a player, not knowing it was me because I wasn't there, and he didn't know where I was at. We didn't know what hospital he's at, so we just started calling hospitals. We called, you know, a couple different hospitals, and to no avail. And never in, in the world did it ever occur to me that I might have to pitch that night. You know, I was scheduled to pitch game three, so you know, I didn't figure they needed me for anything other than maybe a pinch run, but we, can't, we had a couple other guys we probably could have used in that situation. Until we couldn't get a hold of no hospitals, we decided to call up Martin Joe because we thought he'd be listening to the ball game or watching it somewhere. So we called up uh, Marty and Joe's booth, Marty Bram and Joe Nuxall's booth, and uh, we told them if, you know, if they could relay the message to somewhere to, you know, to tell them that, you know, Tom, we need you back. We need you back to the, the field. You know, they need you, to, they need you to pitch. We understand that Tom Browning's wife, Debbie, has gone into labor. He has left the ballpark, and a call apparently has just come up from the Reds clubhouse to make an appeal over our airwaves for Tom Browning to come back to the ballpark in the event that they have to use him to pitch tonight. So, Tom, if you're listening to the broadcast, uh, we've just gotten a word that from the Reds clubhouse that, uh, if at all possible, please get back to the ballpark in the event that they might need you. Of course, Tom wasn't listening to the radio. He was listening to television, and that was the first time he heard it from me when I announced it. We just learned that Tom Browning earlier left the ballpark, his wife went into labor. The Reds club
clubhouse called up to Marty Brenneman, the local radio announcer here in Cincinnati. He's been doing Reds baseball for 17 years, asking Marty to make a public announcement and tell Tom Browning to return to the ballpark because Lou Pinella might be out of pitchers, and he may be thinking of using Tom Browning in the game tonight. I've never heard of anything that unusual happen in a ball game. And when I heard that, I got up and I was pacing the floor, and she was 15, 20, 25 minutes away from giving birth, and I, I, I couldn't leave, and I, you know, I wasn't going to leave. There was just no way. I was just hoping that whoever was pitching would either hold the lead or somebody hit a home run and we win the ball game before, you know, before, at least until after the baby was born. And fortunately, we won the ball game and took care of all the matters. And the batter is Joel Oliver. That ball is fair. Just 30 minutes after Oliver's game-winning hit, the Brownings had their son. They named him Tucker Thomas, even though another name was there for the taking. The thought never crossed my mind to name him Oliver, but uh, that would have been a good a good thought if uh, we hadn't had a name picked out because he, he took care of business for me on that side. It was great. Cincinnati Reds manager Lou Pinella was recently the subject of a charity roast in Florida. Lou accepted the abuse of accomplished roasters to help raise funds for an infirmary, one to be built by the Salesian Sisters of Tampa. You only roast the ones you love, so we do it with a little barb but a little gentleness. Tonight will be a little more gentle because the Salesian Sisters are in the audience. So many of your 1990 Cincinnati Reds hold you in such great respect that none of them came here tonight, Lou. <laughs> They're all spending another exciting night in Plant City. But I have a chance to fly all the way across the state from Fort Lauderdale to Tampa just to, just to rip Lou, and I'm looking forward to it. When I say it was logical, it reminds me of the story when we were flying from coast to coast one time from New York to California on a, one of these charter jets that we had. And the captain came on the, on the microphone and said, uh, about a half hour into the trip, he says, guys, I'm, I'm, you know, no reason to panic. He says, but uh, we have engine trouble with our number four engine, but we have three other engines that will get us to the west coast, so no reason to panic. The only problem is we're going to be a half hour late. And Lou didn't say anything. He just sat there looking at me and just, I could see he was thinking. About an hour later into the flight, the captain came on again. He said, well, uh, gentlemen, we have another problem with our number three engine, and I'm afraid that, uh, you know, we have enough power to get there with the remaining two engines, but the problem is now we're going to be an hour and a half late. Yeah, a little bit of grumbling and everything, but Lou didn't say anything, you know. He was over there thinking. About an hour later in the flight, here comes the captain on the microphone again. Gentlemen, no reason to panic. Our other engine went out, but we have one engine left, and it's going to get us to the West Coast. The only problem is now we're going to be three hours late. Lou looks over at me and he says, you know, Greg, he says, if that other engine goes out, we're going to be up here all day. <laughs> Women don't roast, but I'm going to toast. And, you know, I did, Shotzi gave me a letter to read to Lou, okay? Dear Uncle Lou, so I can't be there with my dog mom to protect you at your roast. I hope you have a positively doggone great time. I am not shedding until opening day, so I will have lots of bags of my dog here to help you repeat in 91. We'll select Shotzi. People like him. Yeah, he won the World Championship, didn't he? You know what's going on. I'm sending you back to Brooklyn. No habit in America can a man come from a poor neighborhood and a poor family and help that family by selling newspapers and shining shoes and look towards a dream. And finally, that dream has come true, where today is one of the best loved men of the entire nation. But enough about me. What are you, a nut? Are you a nut, Lou? There's one thing I want to tell you. If there's ever a price on your head, take it. It was one of the few times the fiery Pinella was rendered speechless. 
Well, I can't follow that act, but uh, certainly I'm very appreciative that it's come. And uh, the good thing here is that the big winners here, the Salesian men, uh, they certainly uh, played an integral part in my formative years, and I'm appreciative. Hollywood's tradition of honoring its own takes place Monday night with the Academy Awards. But here, with an unofficial preview, are baseball's picks for the best and worst of the silver screen. Probably one of the better movies I've seen in a long time was Dances with Wolves. I think Silence of the Wolves right now is leading in the candidate of it's probably the best thriller I've seen in a long time. I rent movies. I don't get to go to the movie theater because I never have any dates. Joe vs. the Volcano was without a doubt the worst movie. And no one in the world should go see that movie. Ford Fairlane, Adventures of Ford Fairlane, stupid movie. Oh, well, the best movie I think I've ever seen in my life was Silence of the Lambs. Home Alone, it was just an outstanding movie. And I have a little boy, and uh, uh, he's already <laughs> seems to be that type of kid. And I, I, I could just imagine someday that happening to me. Oh, Home Alone, I didn't think that was pretty good at all. I had a problem with... Uh... I hate to say it, but it was the, the Russia house, you know? I mean, it was tough to follow. And, God, I mean, I held on as long as I could. And the next thing I know, boom, there were the credits. I like Pretty Woman, but I think I like Julia Roberts quite a bit, so I think that's the biggest reason I like that movie. And my wife, all the time, hey, let's go to the movies, go to the movies. I, I hate to go. I mean, because during the season, you're always out doing things. And in the offseason, again, I'm just one of the most low-key guys you ever want to meet. And I think I've seen one movie in, in six years. And, uh, babe, I'm sorry. I'm, I'll go to the movies next year. Next offseason. I promise. Our stat of the week centers on Nolan Ryan, the king of K's, who's left even the best contact hitters waving at air. Breaking ball got him swinging, and that's three for Boggs. Never thought I'd see it three times in one day. Got him swinging. Nolan Ryan punches out Paul Molitor to begin things here in Milwaukee. Two strike pitch. He just throws the ball right by Carney right there. That is the fifth strikeout of the ball game for the all-time K King. Well, believe it or not, not every hitter Ryan faces strikes out. Some guys just seem to have his number. Tonight. On deck for next week, a fraternity of fur at the mascot training camp. A hands-on experience. The parrot is just a wild, <laughs> the wooly guy. Get a picture together. Ooh. It's hard to teach them. I'm learning a lot from these guys. Oh, that's a lot. They're uh, really a uh, top bunch of professionals who, who love what they do. It's obvious in them doing it. This is Warner Fusell. Major League Baseball magazine is brought to you by United Airlines, together with United Express, serving over 200 cities in the U.S. and around the world. Come fly the friendly skies. And by Major League Baseball home videos. Call 1-800-328-8500 to order your copy of the 1990 World Series.